Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the Cisco sponsor track sessions here at the Open Infrastructure Summit. Summit. It's a little early, so I'm slurring my speech just a little bit. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the second of four sessions that we're going to be having today. Uh, we just had a little uh, session on a very high-level view of the telco stack. Uh, we're going to go next with Ian Wells and Chandra Ganguly from our cloud cloud platform and solutions group and we're going to go into virtualized mobile networking using OpenStack and I will turn it over to the trusty hands of Ian and we're off to the races. Uh, good morning everybody. Um, so um, what we're going to talk about here today is uh, I get to give you a little bit of our philosophy about why we design things the way we do and uh, Chandra will give you more detail about uh, what we've learned as we've built mobile networks uh, using, as a company, obviously Cisco sell quite a lot of components in this space. Uh, we work on the platform element of this, which involves OpenStack and, and the needs of a platform in a service provider, um, how, to, how to deal with it, how to operate it, how to tune it. Um, and so we'll talk about what we've learned and how we work with platforms as we're designing mobile networks. Um, so, uh, as I say, the first part of this is... Um, sort of our viewpoint, how we see this and where we, uh, how we uh, tailor our platform to suit the use cases. And then you'll see some practical ideas of how that's put together in a network to, um, in real life. Um, so the, the state of the SP segment. Um, this is really our viewpoint. You can see um, the curve on the right there might look rather familiar. We have a, a, a peak and then a trough. Uh, as people, you know, expect a great deal from a platform like OpenStack, like, uh, like NFV, if we're being honest. Um, and then it turns out not to actually meet the hype. But as people become into realization, it is actually practically usable, and you do get somewhere with it. So um, we, we're sort of leveling off on that enhanced productivity part of the curve today. So uh, again, it was um, maybe a little bit hard for us in the beginning because we were um, trying to um, figure out what we could do with this, what was practical, how to get this working, how, it, where the problems lay, honestly, with the system. Um, but it, become, it became mainstream maybe a, um, three years ago, give or take. Uh, we're now looking that, um, particularly in mobile networks, there are a lot of moving parts in a mobile network where software is actually the best way of delivering the functionality that you're looking for. And so being able to come up with a manageable mobile network where you can do uh, upgrades in place um, where you can keep your customers satisfied and where you can run all of that on a software-based platform is an incredibly useful thing. Uh, another component that's, um, uh, um, or market that's been taking off for us is managed services, where what we're doing is uh, helping service providers deliver um, a set of managed services, a menu of services that their customers uh, can consume um, for, for enterprise uh, space. Um, and the initial driver here was definitely, definitely on the cost-saving aspect of things. But I think as things have, um, uh, have matured, then uh, service providers now realize that there's a great deal of agility that can be gained from doing this. The, the idea that you can, uh, if you start going down the path of a decent CI-CD model, then you can um, uh, test your, um, bring your software together. It's so much easier to bring software together than it is to basically get a box from every vendor concerned into your lab every time you're doing an update. Um, and then you can run through automated tests as you do that within your lab in order that you can be certain that when you bring upgrades into production, you know that they're going to work without causing you problems. So agility has been a very interesting aspect of what works here. Um, 5G, obviously, we all recognize that 5G is coming. The important thing to understand about 5G, 5G is it's a sea change in the products and the protocols uh, required in a mobile network. So again, it, it's one of those uh, lift and shift things that goes on roughly every 10 years. And it means that there's a big change that's coming to every mobile operator at this point in time. So um, that means uh, new deliveries of different uh, functionality, which tend again to come as software in these days. Uh, and edge computing is obviously a very exciting area for us right now. The idea that as we, uh, as we get to the point of having software deliverables, we can actually deploy them once or many times. And if it should not be any harder to deploy them 100 times than once or 1,000 times. So you can now push the edge of your network further and further away from the center and out in towards your customer. Uh, and that can deliver a number of bit, bit, bits of value. Um, 
So we, we have um, progress in terms of getting the performance that we're looking for in um, these applications, making sure we can run them as fast as we can, get the maximum value out of uh, a server. Uh, also in standardization, um, trying to work out what the standards tell you versus what actually works in practice has been one of those uh, journeys that we've all had to travel. And the early deployments, particularly uh, in the edge side of things, as we start to do uh, virtualized RAN, virtualized radio networks, has been, um, again, an education for us. Um, there are challenges. Obviously, um, within a service provider, you've got an operations team, and now they're operating in an entirely new and different world because they've got platforms and software to deal with. So um, kind of developing a culture change within service provider organi organizations is, is certainly one of the uh, hurdles to getting full implementation of this. Um, trying to make sure because, again, many moving parts here, that you're getting visibility. You understand when something is going wrong, as soon as it's going wrong, and what you should be doing about it. Trying to get those processes in place and trying to get the observability in place to make that possible has been um, a learning curve as well. Um, and managing those expectations, making sure that everybody knows what they're getting, but also this is as far as you go and no further. You can wish for more than this, um, but at this point in time, this is what works. Um, that's been a, a, a learning curve with our customers. And it does all come down to money. The reason that this is driving, uh, being driven forward is because people see that they can either deliver more value to their customers, they can make more money out of their customers, because they can offer customer experiences that the customers could never previously have. They can improve uh, on um, how they use their network. Uh, also, they can get services out there faster, because again, that agility means that you can do more uh, faster and you can you can get the results to your customers as soon as possible but um, similarly uh, money um, it has the flip side which is how can I save money by doing this um, you can make more efficient use of network resources and the orchestration conversation we talked about in the previous session orchestrating not only the virtual part of the network but the physical part of the network getting them to work to a common end is something that allows you to deliver uh, more value out of your fixed assets your wiring in your service provider network uh, OPEX spend on operations, um, again, Chandra will join in with our, uh, our solution part of this later on, but um, basically the, the art with delivering software is to make sure that when you're running 100 or 1,000 deployments, it is not costing you 100 or 1,000 times running one deployment. So keeping the operational spend under control is absolutely key to making this a success. Um, so um, the deployment strategies here we've drawn up, we've seen all three of these, right? Number one is where people were, were hoping this would go in the early days. Basically, mix and match. You would pull uh, the c different components from the best vendor for the task, the cheapest hardware, uh, a virtualization stack that suited you, or maybe multiple virtualization stacks because they had different strengths and weaknesses, um, and then VNS from whoever and orchestration from whoever as well. But there are a number of limitations with this, one of which is that... Um, uh, the mix and match means you've got a lot of touch points between these compo components and a lot of integration tests to do to actually find out if this is going to work. Also, mixing and matching here components that ultimately don't need to be different uh, leads you to the fact that you've got a bunch of, um, of MOPs, of operations procedures, that, that you've effectively got multiple copies of, simply because dealing with one pl virtualization platform, dealing with another virtualization platform, how you do that is different. Um, number two is, is very much a favorite among vendors, I would like to say. We would love to deliver you uh, everything top to bottom, built by us, integrated by us. It, it does work. There's no two ways about it. But it's not practical because, again, you end up with a bunch of opera operational procedures. Uh, you ultimately end up with silos, and it can actually lead to the service provider organization itself becoming siloed. So I own this. This is mine. I will not share my experiences, or I cannot share my experiences. Um, a common platform and a common mano stack has what have been what we've found works best with the customers that we've been working for. Um, it leads to uh, a platform which is best of breed, which is capable of running VNFs from whoever you wish to buy from. And the mano stack should be common because you're trying to orchestrate all of your VNFs to one common purpose, to deliver a network. Um, this one is not perfect. Again, uh, there's no perfect here. It does involve getting the service provider to actually um, see the benefits involved outside of their own domain. So you're talking to transport people, you're talking to um, mobile VNF people, perhaps the difference between voice and, uh, and uh, data in a mobile network, to take an example. 
um, and trying to get to s them to see that the success of their company lies beyond their own perspective. But uh, it's the one that brings the most value if you can get it to work. Um, and uh, absolutely the majority of uh, the market today exists in models two and three. Model one is still a dream, but I think it's a dream that we have to evolve towards rather than one that we're going to jump to straight away. Um, so um, this is a fairly, um, I, I'm, I'm getting very tired of drawing this diagram, this is a fairly simplistic um, representation of a service provider network. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we like to talk about edge computing. This has got a core and it's got an edge. In the core on the right-hand side, there are a very small number of sites involved. They're very big sites. They're very well-managed sites. They've got people in. They're actually, you know, conventional data centers with decent cooling and good quantities of power and good quantities of backup. Um, and there are plenty of things that you can run in those cores. You can run um, uh, a mobile packet core. You can run the uh, VNFs that control your network, that determine policy and billing for your network. You can run the elements that actually manage your network, the OSS elements that deal with whether your network is operating at peak capacity, whether there's tuning you want to do to it, observation, logging, and so on. Um, you can run... Um, uh, things that you normally run uh, peering points like third-party CDNs, uh, NAT gateways to make your V4 addresses stretch further. Um, you can run uh, video um, transcoding as well to ensure that your, your video is delivered in the most optimal way to the various devices on your network. Um, that works just great. But if you look at what's on the right-hand side, then we start getting to um, further and further out to the side of the network you get less control over the sites, the light sites are less suitable, but the sites are a whole bunch closer to your customer. Now, obviously, at the moment, today, we can deliver services on the customer premise with a box that, that, that's put there, but uh, what we'd like to do is work out what we can do with these services, with these sites uh, further and further out, and that's been the journey in recent times, figuring out how to get the additional value on that side of the uh, graph. Um, and uh, you get much closer to the customer, and that can lead to a couple of benefits, one of which is more experience that you can deliver to the customer, one of which is um, uh, that you can reduce the amount of backhaul on the wide area network that um, reduces or increases the value you can deliver with the same piece of fiber. Um, and there's elements that we're seeing that come out here now. So um, uh, packet core in a network slicing world in 5G can be on-prem, for instance. Uh, a virtualized RAM has limitations to how close it's got to be to the mobile um, radio heads. So I need to be within 10 kilometers of my antenna to virtualize the radio access network part of a 5G network. Um, and uh, going further and further in, then we start wanting to deliver additional added value services that we can do because we're geographically close to our customer. Um, so the key considerations here are trying to figure out um, the cloud infrastructure you're going to do, whether it's going to be virtual machines or containers, what's cost effective when you multiply it up a thousand times over is not the same as what's cost effective when you put it in the core. Um, the performance uh, is an IT level of performance is not necessarily going to deliver um, a packet forwarding application. They have different requirements. And RAN in particular is also a very real-time application which, uh, which can lead to problems in virtualization deployment. Uh, network services, similarly, um, this is both about the control of the VNFs that you're dealing with and the control of your WAN. Uh, do you want it to be centralized, um, which can lead to connectivity problems and can lead to overload as you basically condense everything into a single location versus distributed, which can uh, leave you with questions of how you're going to manage that. Uh, VNF is the same. Am I trying to put the control plane in the center and the user plane out at the edge where we're forwarding traffic? Um, trying to deal with service chains which are now more often than not into data center. They're not simply in a single location. Um, being ready for the 5G and the, the, the um, challenges of network slicing that come along with that. Uh, and again, I would focus on the operations model because the expense of operating this network can't be underestimated. If you get it wrong, it will drain your pockets. So uh, understanding what you're going to do in terms of lifecycle management of the platform and the applications of operation, understanding when you have a problem and how to fix it without having all hands on deck. Um, so our approach to the service provider segment is obviously bu built into our products. At the bottom end of this, we have the virtual infrastructure manager, the VIM, uh, which is the product we sell, um, uh, delivering not just OpenStack, but the manageability that's necessary to make that work in a service provider network. At the top end, the two parts of the Mano stack that actually orchestrate VNFs. We have 
no religion on whose VNFs we're running. We obviously supply some of our own, um, but we really expect any service provider would choose the best VNF for the task from the appropriate manufacturer. So it's not going to all be Cisco in that, in that location. Um, and so uh, we are evolving from the left to the right. We certainly started with vertical stack solutions. Uh, we are, I would say, most of the way to the right at this point in time. We work with our own hardware. We also work with third-party hardware. We work with our own VNFs and third-party VNFs. We work with our own Mano and third-party Mano, and we have examples of all of those today. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Chandra, who's going to talk about the product itself. Sure. So thank you, Ian. Um, so, so far, what Ian had showed, uh, shown uh, is really the philosophy in which we, we have evolved this platform. What I'm going to talk about is more practical implementation of this platform and where we have installed it in scale. Uh, so, and some of the uh, typical use cases and, and challenges that we have gone through. Um, so, what what I want to point out here is typically people in this conference on, and and lot and similar conferences really focus on. OpenStack or Kubernetes or whatever the underlying infrastructure of the platform is. What we are trying to show here is that's definitely the anchored and one of the most important things. But if you, you but along with that, you also need to consider other day to uh, you know factors or operational uh, situations that you will encounter because that is where uh, once you have the cloud up and running, your cost slash TCO, TCO optimization will come through. So I'm not going to go through every details of it, but I'll just take, let's say, one uh, particular factor. Let's talk about the lifecycle manager. There we are talking about, let's say, uh, your cloud is running, a 100 node cloud is running, and one of the nodes go bad. How do you go, ahead, go about replacing that node without any uh, impact to the rest of the VNFs running on the cloud? Uh, similarly, let's say there is a security bug that came in, and you have to do a software update. How do you go about doing a software update and many of the security bugs include a reboot of the compute nodes. Um, how do you go about doing that without impacting traffic? So those are the considerations that I would request that when, as you are choosing a Vim platform, think through those. And that is something that Cisco Vim has in, in incorporated in many of its, you know, a, as in this journey that we've gone through. Just like also another thing is just like you have an API for OpenStack, we also have an API for this cloud platform to manage the cloud platform. So the advantage with that is now if I have thousands of clouds, I still have a common API, and I can manage all these clouds from a central location. And that is quite powerful. You don't have to go to you know, SSH to every cloud or, or the management node of the cloud to do anything. You can manage it all centrally from your OSS BSS system. And, and typically, a cloud platform that you see in the industry doesn't have it, but we have. That is something we have considered. And that entire REST API-based cloud management is over TLS and secured. And, and with obviously, uh, you know, potential for bringing in certificates and whatnot. Um, so how, how has this evolved? Um, so obviously, uh, based on uh, customer uh, feedback, what we have, what we initially started with is the CDC, where we have a full-on stack, like control, compute, storage, all separated out, all you know, dedicated nodes associated to that. What we, what we heard from our customers is based on the location, you might end up in a situation where you might only have a very small, cap, you know, physical location, right? So you might have to collapse the cloud into an extremely small. Um, footprint called Micropod, or as you go towards the very edge, you can you actually don't even have space to put storage. So we have come something called an edge pod that we have developed, and I'll talk about a little bit more about the edge pod a, a bit later. And now what we are doing is we're actually expanding it to what is called nanopods. This is the work that we are currently doing. As you can see now, a given customer, and I'll talk about that customer in a bit, has a, has a footprint based on the location of various form factors of the cloud. Now, how do you manage this cloud? This is where a common API, which will help manage, doesn't matter the cloud type or pod type, you can actually manage it from a central OSS BSS system through REST API is what we are talking about. Obviously, on top of that is your um, you know, VNF manager or, or you know, NFVO. It can be, again, one or multiple, but obviously the idea of typically a customer would be to have one so that they don't have to retrain their guys to have three different you know, NFVOs, if you will. Um, 
So this is, this is something that is existing today in CVIM, and we'll talk about uh, our use cases associated to that. So before I go to talk about use cases, this is a laundry list, and this is not only a starting laundry list of things one would I would request that if you're considering cloud, you can you know plan plan it out as part of the evolution in your journey because these are the things operational challenges that come into play on day two, day three. Once you have the cloud up and running for four or five months, now you have to go do a software upgrade or upgrade. What do you do? So this is this is kind of a laundry list of what, what it is, and any one of these needs to be factored in. So let's talk about two case studies I'm going to talk about. So these are practical, physical implementation that is going on, and actually that has happened in the world right now. So it's not like anything is theoretical here. The first one I will talk about is what we have with Vodafone India. Vodafone India, I would say, is a brownfield. So they already had a Cisco mobility. They were a Cisco mobility shop running ASR 5500s. They went, wanted to go from you know, those physical boxes to a virtual world. And they obviously bought CVIM, and, uh, and on top of them, they were running the in Cisco's virtual pa you know, packet core. But what, and this is currently running in, in 13 cities in India. So let's say if you're in a city in Guwahati or, or Mumbai or Calcutta, um, you actually are running on a virtual network or for your, if you are on Vodafone India. Uh, so there are 13 sites that already are in production, and they are expanding that to 40 sites. And in the 40 sites, the one in like Mumbai and Calcutta are huge, like because of the subscriber. Uh, like uh, Cochin is typically about two million subscribers, so those are pretty large. But at the other 40 sites, because they are small towns, they are don't have, they don't need to put in a full full pod. They are putting what is called a micro pod with additional computes, because there the subscriber um, uh, scale is much lower. But what they have done with this now, they have got it to a point that right from racking, stacking, power on, to getting the cloud on, to the getting the VNF on, in three days, 72 hours, they can now do it. They are now got it to the point that it's pretty much a cookie cutter operations model. So this is the agility that they have got. Um, also, they, what they have done is they have updated the clouds. In more, you know, this 13 sites I've talk, talked about, they started in January of last year, not this year, January of last year, and over this one year, these 13 sites have gone through software updates as well to take care of security fixes, additional features. We also support different combination of hardware, so they wanted the latest generation hardware. All of this has happened with software update without outage, without any outage. So data plane continues to work. We have a mechanism to do the software update. Wherever reboot is needed, we defer the reboot, and operator decides at what point a reboot is needed. If they will go ahead and do the reboot. This way, what happens is data traffic continues to flow. So that's one case. Second, uh, by the way, this is all open, um, uh, open knowledge. It's the press releases below right there. Uh, second one is what I call is the latest one is the Rakuten model, which basically Rakuten is a greenfield use case where they never were in the virtual, mo uh, you know, uh, virtual uh, mobile world. Uh, they essentially wanted to bring in uh, get into the mob mobile world space. Um, what they did is, they, so they have no legacy hardware. It's all virtual, all right from day one. But where they differed from most of the other service providers is they actually took the mo virtual world to the edge. So the, the VDUs and VCUs, are the, so the RAN, radio access network, is also virtualized, which is the first in the world. Um, and there are quite a bit of challenges, and I'll talk about a bit on what those challenges we went through. This is an year in one year in progress and as of today they have 700 clouds already up and running in Japan um, in 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 a world, you know in uh, and and they have actual subscriber 5000 odd subscribers already accessing that network uh, what it what is important also is this is a pure ipv6 network so there's no ipv4 across any, any packet that is exiting any of this cloud is all IP, ipv4 ipv6 so what they have is in the in the center they have a cdc and they have at the very edge what is called GCs or VLAN edge clouds. They are also evolving to what is called RDC, regional data centers. So as they scale up, what they have is a few, a handful of clouds at the core, a much bigger set of clouds at, at, the, at this, what is called regional data center, and lots of small clouds at the edge. 
Now, obviously, this brings the numbers we are talking about eventually will be in thousands. So today, they are in hundreds. And what, so to evolve this, what they did is they actually came up with a very, very innovative way of and, and deviated from the traditional approach. So to obviously, they want to make sure that the user experience when they go from any part of Japan, even to the, as they're evolving to the roaming, is the same. They're also evolving from the legacy architecture to the uh, distributed cloud native architecture. So with the, the CVM also supports, and one of my colleagues will talk about the CCP or Cisco Container Platform on top of CVM, one of the talks later, we'll talk about that. Obviously, we've, they've, they've taken a model of going virtualizing the RAN. And one of the things you will see a lot of service providers do with multiple SKUs. They have standardized on a handful of SKUs. Why? Because they have to operate this huge number of clouds just to scale. Um, they have their own OSS, BSS system. They wanted every customer to provide REST API for everything. So that's something they've done. So they've, they've normalized on that. They don't want anybody's UIs. Because at the end of the day, so many vendors are coming in. The number of UIs are just insane. So they said, everybody give me a REST API, and I will write the whole UI myself. That's what they went with. The whole cloud operation actually is today done by actually about less than 100, 100 people today. You know, today. And they have a completely CI, CD based model. Every vendor that is participating all has what is called, you know, is participating in the CI, CD model. So if you look at it, what they have done is they've come up with a common hardware, common VIM, all the NF, VNFs can be any one or n, n number of vendors, and with a common Mano stack. Actually, to be truth be told, they have two Mano stacks because of time to market, they have two, but essentially their plan is to converge to one. The why this works is basically everything has a common REST API. So you can have multiple clouds, but on the top, the same API. So it doesn't matter whether it's a micro pod or an edge pod or a full pod, they all work in through the same API. This is a, a, a eye chart of all the various VNF vendors that is hosted by the CVIM cloud. A total today of about 189 VNFs operate in this, you know, in this model. So and the, and the vendors anywhere from Nokia to Altiostar to Cisco to InnoI to Mavenier, all of that is floating around here. Um, all, some of those are written here. So one of the uh, challenges that Rakuten came up is this cloud at the edge, where there is constraints on hardware, uh, constraints on power, constraints on space. So what we did is we actually came up with a C modified CVM to essentially maximize, uh, obviously fully automated, uh, autonomous self-contained cloud, but we maximized the CPU. So what we did is collapse the control and the comp compute uh, control and the compute on the same nodes. We only use like a few cores for the host. Rest we give it to the compute for the workload. We also uh, essentially tune the uh, platform to the kernel that is running as a real time kernel. So that way, you know, because of the VRAN latency requirements, you could not put a normal, you know, regular OS, uh, operating system. Um, but at the same time, we made made sure that the operational experience is consistent, whether it's the edge pod or the full pod, because it's the same REST API. Um, we also made sure the entire, all the clouds we're talking about has full monitoring integrated in, as part of the cloud as an option. Um, obviously, we, we to, for, to run VRAN, we also added hardware acceleration on the, on, onto the same cloud. So in conclusions, um, what we will, what our main goal here in this talk is, um, yes, CVIM can bring in a, complete and proven solution to meet your requirements. Obviously, there are adaptations we have done. Uh, we have to make this cloud open. That is, it can run on multiple vendors platform, if you will, the different SKUs. In the case of Rakuten, it's running on Quanta hardware. In the case of Vodafone, and are running on Cisco UCS. We also support other uh, third-party platforms as well. Uh, we've also made sure that whatever we do, the net TS TCO at the end is lowered. Uh, so you, as you scale out, it's not like you need 10 more people as you continue to scale out. It has to taper down. Your operation cost cannot keep on going up. That is the most important. As we have designed this, we've also made sure it's secured. The cloud can be monitored for, for, for both from logging and assurance point of view. Um, also, we proven, which is kind of the first in the world, uh, that VRAN workloads can be, can be uh, you know, put on a cloud. Um, so we do 
uh, you know, thanks to many of our customer, we have got some experience in this journey. Uh, but as the next step from this is evolving to CNFs or container platforms, uh, one of my colleagues in two, the, the third or last talk of the session, he'll talk about how he's using that. You know, he will give you an example of how uh, Cisco Container Platform is also running on CD. With that, I conclude my talk. Any questions? I'm back in. <laughs> I think we're good. A um, couple, of, a couple of points before I go into some time for Q and A with uh, Chandra and Ian. All these sessions, all the sessions that you come to at the summit are recorded, obviously, and these all go up very, very quickly on the OpenStack Foundation YouTube channel. So I know a lot of people are getting pictures of the session as the session goes on, but full recordings of all the sessions that you come to here at the summit will be up on the OpenStack Foundation uh, YouTube channel. So you can go back and uh, go through any of the details in the session. The other thing I wanted to mention was, again, as Chandra mentioned, come down to the Cisco booth uh, in the marketplace. We have demos available on all the technology that we've been showing here today, especially the virtual infrastructure manager for the CVIM product. And with that, I'll open up the floor to any questions for Chandra and Ian. Wow, you have successfully explained everything it takes to virtualize a mobile network. I'm very impressed. I'm not actually more impressed with you as I am with them, because they've already got it figured out. I'll let the team know. <laughs> you get a raise. Um, any questions at all for Chandra and Ian? Or we can pick up the discussion uh, down in the booth, like I said, down in the marketplace. Um, OK, so we expect virtualized mobile networks from all of you by the end of lunch. Or maybe not. OK. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. We do have uh, actually the next session uh, that is coming up starting at 10.40, 10.50. At 10.50, there's the morning break coming up. Uh, but at 10.50, we are actually very fortunate to have a member of the Rakuten team, uh, Ashik Khan, who will be here and presenting uh, a deeper dive on what Rakuten is doing with their uh, mobile network. So I hope you can come back and join us then at 10.50. Thank you, Ian and Chandra. <laughs>